Hello and welcome to another exciting installation of the UB Bulls Bullseye Nation postgame podcast. It is going to be a great one today, especially after a huge, thrilling win against the Toledo Rockets. I'm John Karuba. I'm going to be taking you through it, and we are going to have a jam-packed show for you tonight. And really excited about it, because not only do we have the voice of the UB Bulls, Paul Peck, coming on, we're also going to talk to Norm Rodriguez, and that is going to be a real treat. Another broadcaster knows the UB Bulls well, and a real treat for you, so I can't wait for you to hear that as well. Plus, we will give you some highlights from the game and stats and a whole lot more. So once again, there's no better place to celebrate a big UB Bulls win than right here on Bullseye Nation, the post-game podcast, and it starts right now. How you doing, Bullseye Nation? I am John Karuba. I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm sure a lot of you listening to this are as well. And I mean, what else can you say? The beast of the East vanquished the best of the West, the Toledo Rockets. And they certainly didn't make it easy, but they did it coming back from 27 to 10 down. That's correct. 27 to 10 down after three quarters. Well, for UB, it was no big deal because they scored three consecutive touchdowns in a row and then a field goal to hang on thanks to the big interception at the goal line to end the game, winning it 34-27 over the Toledo Rockets. And again, what else can you say about this team, folks? They have been resilient from day one, and you've seen it really especially And I think Coach Lindquist in his postgame comments said it best. You know, he said, this is a microcosm of our season. It definitely is. This team had to overcome so much adversity, had to overcome so many different challenges, and yet they have risen above all of it and now find themselves at 5-3, 4-0 in the MAC. Life's pretty sweet now as a UB Bulls football fan, isn't it, folks? I mean, again, you beat one of the best teams in the MAC, the best team in the MAC West. And quite frankly, next week you have a big game, which we'll preview later on in the show, but a huge game coming up next week on Halloween at Peden Stadium in Athens, Ohio, which is not a place that brings fond memories for the UB Bulls. They do struggle there, but if this UB Bulls team can pull out a win there, that pretty much is going to sew up the Mackies for the Bulls. I mean, I really don't see anyone else challenging them for the most part, but Ohio is still nipping at their heels. They're 3-1 and one in MAC conference play, and they beat Northern Illinois earlier today. Meanwhile, for the UB Bulls, they go to 4-0 and oh in the MAC East, but still, what a huge win, and the way they did it, too. It was a mix of passing from Cole Snyder, Not to mention Ron Cook, who was phenomenal rushing the football, but Marcus Fuqua. You know, you heard Paul Peck talk about him in the postgame last time, and he really was speaking glowingly of him. Well, he earned those honors because Marcus Fuqua stepped up when this team needed it. Three interceptions on the day. He was outstanding out there. He was a one-man wrecking crew, but... I do think the UB Bulls defense did an outstanding job on the Toledo quarterback, Finn. They were able to pressure him outside the pocket. Yes, he did have his big runs. You know what? With a quarterback like that, it's going to happen. But they kept him under control, shut him out in the fourth quarter, and picked him off three times in the second half. I mean, that is about as good of a job as you can do. And for the Bulls, if you look at who they've beaten now, You beat Miami, Ohio, who was largely considered to be your biggest threat coming into the season in the Mackeys. Now you've beaten them. You beat Bowling Green, which is another team that's right in the mix. And now you just took care of Toledo, the best team in the Mac West. I mean, Ohio is really the last real challenge that this team is going to face. But You know, it's so encouraging to see what the Bulls are able to do. They never hang their heads. They never give up. They never feel like they're out of a game. And again, one more time, you know, it's funny. Coach Linquist had another good response, I thought, 
when Paul on the post game was asking him as far as, you know, what do you think about all the naysayers and doubters? And Lindquist just looked at him and he said, do you believe now? And, and really, that's the confidence that we have seen in this football team throughout this five-game winning streak. And they deserve to be 5-3 and three on the season, 4-0 and oh in MAC play. They are the living embodiment of the saying that, you know what, for the Bulls, the football season doesn't really start until MAC play begins. Well, that's holding true for them because they started 0-3. But they are 4-0 and in the MAC, and right now sitting at 5-3, and one of the best overall records in the conference. So they have taken care of division and conference play and then some. And if you're UB right now, you got to be through the roof as far as your chances of winning a championship for the MAC in Detroit. And now you just showed you can hang and beat the best team in the MAC West. So very exciting time to be a UB Bulls fan. And again, it's going to be great throughout this program to break this exciting contest down. So as we do that, we will begin by giving you some stats to the game. And so we will do that right now in the UB Bulls 34-27 victory over Toledo. For UB, they actually lost the first down battle in this one, 22 to 19, which is not something that's usual for them. Usually, they win the first down battle, but Toledo gets the edge in this one, 22 to 19. Toledo five of 17 on third down. UB five of 16. For Toledo three of five on fourth down. UB was 0 for three on fourth down. Meanwhile, total yardage also favored Toledo, 438 to 398. UB did have the edge, though, in the passing game, 245 to 240. Cole Snyder went 22 of 39 for 245 yards and a touchdown. And Daquan Finn, you know what, for being one of the best quarterbacks in the MAC, yes, he did go for 240 yards. But his stat line was not pretty today, folks. 25 of 47, one touchdown, four picks, three in the second half. So what a job by this UB defense. And to put it in perspective, Finn, the quarterback for the Rockets, was so good that he played so well a couple weeks ago in the loss at Ohio State. People were saying, what Big Ten team is he going to play for in a couple of weeks from now? I mean, that's how eye-opening his performance was. Well, to the UB Bulls, they said, we'll take that, and we don't really care. They did an outstanding job of just keeping Finn under control. Yes, like I said, he did have some rushes. He set up some drives with his legs. But if you can hold the best quarterback in the MAC to one touchdown on four picks, uh, I think you've had a pretty good day. So Toledo averaged five yards per pass through the air, 6.3 for the Bulls. And again, the four picks for Toledo, none for UB, and that's significant. They turned the ball over a couple of times in their past couple wins. They wanted to clean that up. Well, they did through the passing game today as all four interceptions were thrown by the Rockets. Rushing 198 yards for Toledo, 153 for the UB Bulls. And Toledo did have the average, though, in yards per rush, 5.2 to 4 for UB. But then again, that's in large part thanks to Finn and what he was able to do in those wild quarterback scrambles. Penalties, 5 of 30 for Toledo. UB, relatively clean game, four flags for 35 yards. Toledo committed six turnovers in the game. That's right, six compared to just one for UB. The Bulls lost one fumble in the fourth. For Toledo, they lost two fumbles and four interceptions. And incredibly, although it didn't seem like it, but UB actually won the time of possession 3107 to 2853, which the way Toledo was controlling the ball in the first couple of quarters, especially in the first half, certainly didn't seem like that would be the result. But UB, they find a way to get it done and win 34-27. And remember, one of those fumbles by Toledo, that's really what sparked the turnaround, was the 68-yard fumble 
return for the touchdown, and that broke the goose egg. Remember, Toledo was driving. They were up 10-0 in this game. If they go ahead and score and make it 17-0, I think this post game is going to have a totally different tone to it. But because of that big play by the defense, UB cut it from 10-0 to 10-7. I mean, you're talking about a seven-point swing right there, and that was a massive turning point in the game. And then I think the other one was the way UB started that drive late in the third quarter and got into the early part of the fourth, led to the touchdown to make it 27-17 because you started to see the UB Bulls move the football. You know, you really weren't seeing a whole lot of that, but Cole Snyder looked calm. He looked composed. They were getting big yards on the ground. And I think overall that helped put the momentum and swing it permanently in the Bulls favor. And they just continued to steamroll the Rockets in that fourth quarter. Just huge production outscoring them 24, nothing. Now, if you're on the road and you have a 17 point lead in the fourth, you got to love your chance to winning. And I'm sure Toledo did. And then you get outscored 24, nothing in the fourth quarter, just a crushing loss for them. But for the UB Bulls, absolutely a great win. You know, it's funny. I got a T-shirt. It's Bill's Mafia. It shows a buffalo jumping through a table. Well, I wish there was a UB version of it because I would love to have a UB Bull one jumping through a table. That's how excited. That's what I want to do after a thrilling win like this. Just an absolutely big-time performance from this UB Bulls team to pull off the 34-27 win over Toledo. So after getting the upset, let's listen to how they got it done in the game highlights. And that's always a part of the Bullseye Nation postgame show. And as always, it's yours truly behind the mic. And we're going to start the highlights with the aforementioned fumble recovery that really got UB back in the game. Toledo was driving at the UB 35, leading 10-0. And then all of a sudden, UB pulled another one out of the hat on defense. With 10.50 to play here, second quarter, Toledo moving down the field, up 10-0. They go with one receiver wide to the right, two wide left. Shotgun snap, four on the line for UB. They fake the give. Now they'll pitch it far side across the 40. Spins off a defender to the 35, up to the 30, and he loses the football! Picked up by the Bulls at midfield! Far side, there he goes at the 30, 20. This is the huge play the Bulls need. Gonna take it all the way to the house. Touchdown, UB. Talk about a turn of events. Toledo looked like they had the corner down the far side and all of a sudden the running back gets stripped. I believe it was Marcus Fuqua who forced it out and then it was recovered and returned 67 yards down the far sideline. And that's how you get back in the game, folks, with 10.26 to play in the first half. It's now Toledo 10 and UB6. What a defensive play. Talk about coming up big when you're needed most. Absolutely huge recovery and return for the UB Bulls on that play. It's now 10-6 Toledo, 10-26 to go, first half. While that certainly was a momentum changer in the first half, the real momentum changers happened in the fourth quarter, and it began after Cole Snyder had a five-yard keeper for a touchdown. UB kept it rolling. Snyder said, well, I've done it with my legs. Now I'm going to do it with my arm. Airing went out 32 yards to Jamari Gassett, an absolute long bomb, and it got UB back to within a one possession game. Nine forty-five to go here, fourth quarter now, 27-17 Toledo. UB going with two receivers wide to the right, one to the left, shotgun pistol set, running back, Washington off his right shoulder. Four on the line for the Toledo Rockets. UB trying to make a big comeback in this one down 27 to 10. Man in motion to the left side. Fading back, looking to throw. Pumps near side. 
fires and get out of man across the Toledo 15 10 it's gas it all what a move cuts it back to the middle takes it into the end zone touchdown balls Jamari Gassett with a huge hookup from cornerback Cole Snyder. And don't go anywhere, folks. 9.35 to go in regulation. And the Bulls have scored two touchdowns in a row to open the corner. And with 9.35 to go in the fourth, Toledo 27, UB 23. And what a move by Gassett. He caught it along the near sideline. And he put a heck of a move on the defender for Toledo to cut it from his right. As Yubi was going down the field left to right, he was able to cut it back towards the inside, got away from the defender. And after that, he was able to take it to the house 4-6 and just a huge touchdown. The Bulls right back in it. At that point, it was evident, it was clear. The momentum was clearly on the side of the home team, and UB decided to keep it going as Marcus Fuqua came up with a huge interception and set up the UB Bulls at around the Toledo 35-yard line. And, well, the Bulls, as they've been doing throughout this winning streak, they make the Rockets pay for that costly turnover. And in the process, thanks to Ron Cook Jr.'s wheels and the motor that he's got on him, it gives UB their first lead of the ball game midway through the fourth. This game has changed on a dime after a huge interception by UB. It's 8-13 left to go in the fourth, 27-24 Toledo, but the Bulls are sitting pretty. They have the ball at the Toledo 30-yard line, ball on the right hash. UB down the field left to right. They're going to go with two receivers right, one to the left, the chance to take the lead. Running back Cook off the right shoulder of the quarterback, Snyder. Meanwhile, traditional 4-3 look for the visiting Rockets. Shotgun snap, handoff left side to Cook. Takes it up the far side at 30, 25, got the sideline. Look out here, 20, 15, still being pursued. He's at the five, dive for the pylon and gets across. He's into the end zone for the UB touchdown. And all of a sudden, a game that looked like it was getting away from the UB Bulls entering the fourth down 27 to 10. Well, what do you know? Stranger things have happened in college football, folks. And with 8.06 to go, UB takes their first lead of the day. They now are up 31-27 with 8.06 to go in the fourth. What a comeback by your UB Bulls. And an interception at the goal line with three seconds left in the game would seal it for the UB Bulls as they tacked on a field goal by Alex McNulty. And then, as we said, that turnover right at the goal line as Toledo got it down to the UB 22. But Finn scrambled to his right, threw it back towards the left. But right there waiting was the UB Bulls who picked it off and clinched the 34-27 victory. Want to hear what the voice of the UB Bulls has to say about it? Paul Peck? Well, we'll let you in on that right now as I talked with Paul about this big win and look ahead to the huge matchup coming up on Halloween night against Ohio. Sorry to, to hear that you weren't uh, that you weren't feeling well the last couple of days. Hope you're feeling yeah, better. A better better today. I got sick kind of after the game, and then all day Sunday and yesterday was pretty knocked wow. out. So wow. much better today. Thank you. Well, hey, at least at least you got to call an exciting UV win, though. Yeah, how about that, huh? Yeah, it, um, that's that's where we'll pick it up. Uh, huge win. I mean, what do you think? I know we had talked about, you know, the next game being probably more important of the two between Toledo and Ohio, but to be able to do that and the way in which they did it, coming back from three scores down, what do you think this could do for this team, especially the quality of opponent they did it against? Everything that you just said, John, uh, you know, I mean, it just doesn't happen very often in football when you play a rather poor first three quarters 
uh, and then, you know, outscore your opponent 24 to nothing in the fourth quarter to win a game. And that's not just any opponent. That's arguably uh, if the Bulls are the best team in the MAC, then I think that's pretty arguably. And I don't let you get a whole lot of argument that Toledo's number two. Um, that's a really good team, a really good quarterback, really athletic. Uh, you know, and I think as you look back at that game, uh, you know, Buffalo never let Daquan Finn go crazy on them, of which he has done on a number of Mac games this year. Uh, and that kept the game close and that kept it within range. And then obviously in the fourth quarter, Buffalo's defense not only controlled Daquan Finn, but then forced him into mistakes that then led to the comeback. So everything about that win is the kind of win that either cements what you believe to be a very good team or is the kind of win that helps you become a very good team. And I and I think Coach Mo talked about this after the game. I think it just goes back to a season where an 0-3 start didn't put this team in a hole that it couldn't climb out of. So why would 27-10 in the fourth quarter do the same thing? You know, and it's funny you bring up Coach Mo because uh, I was saying earlier, I love the one response he had to the question you had about doubters and naysayers. And he basically simply said, uh, well, do you believe now? Um, you know, that was, I mean, that, 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 I think that kind of shows the confidence that this team is um, building over this five game winning streak now. And I, uh, you know, we were talking about if it's the best team or second best team, just curious, do you think this puts them UB as the best team in the back now with that win? Well, I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's no question about that. I think everybody going into that game felt like these were the two teams by nature of their record, by nature of the way that they had played, by nature of the way that they had dominated some of their conference opponents, that these were the two best teams in the MAC. So if you beat the the, the other team that's supposed to be the best team in the MAC, then, then that's you're the best team in the MAC. Now, all of that said, they only have a one-game lead in the division, and the team that they're playing – a week from, as we record today on Tuesday, in the start of action uh, in Ohio, if Ohio beats Buffalo next week, then guess who is in first place in the MAC East? It's not the Bulls. It's the Bobcats. So, you know, it's a fleeting thing. We can say right now that the Bulls look like the best team in the MAC, but in a week, you could have a completely different answer. So that's the nature of conference play. That's the nature of this conference. Um, but at the moment, yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt the Bulls are the hottest and, and best team in the conference. But, you know, there's still four games left. Indeed, and you know we'll we'll, we'll preview the whole Ohio game in a in a little bit here. But uh, first, you know, in finishing up the victory against Toledo, you know, you could point out a number of different things that were the massive turning point in that game. Whether it was the fumble recovery return for the touchdown when Toledo was driving up ten, you know, if they punch a touchdown in there, they could go up seventeen in the first half. Uh, we might not be having the same conversation or a couple of the touchdowns they got, but where do you think, where do you think this game really turned? Do you think it may have been that late third quarter drive, or what do you think really helped turn this in UB's direction? I think it's the play in the third quarter where the running back breaks out for Toledo and is running down the sideline uh, on his way to what might have been a 60 or 70 yard touchdown. And Isaiah King runs him down from behind and pulls the ball out. And it winds up being a 50 yard run, but it winds up being a forced fumble and fumble recovery by the Bulls. And I think that moment, aside from preventing what could have been another score for the Rockets, but the sheer determination for Isaiah King to chase that player down and pull that ball away incredibly inspired an entire team, um, you know, to to believe that they could make this happen. I think that and then a little later on, and I believe in the third quarter towards the tail end of the third quarter, there was uh, finally the offense broke out with a Ron Cook had about a 40 yard run around the right hand side. And I think those were the two moments where the team was believing and they had proof of belief by seeing the offense finally get going. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I'm glad you mentioned that third quarter dread. That's where I thought. I mean, that was a huge play by King, but I thought that's where it started to turn because I thought Snyder started looking more like the guy we've seen the past four weeks. I thought in the first half, him and the offense was a little erratic and they kind of struggled. And you got to give Toledo credit. I mean, their, their defensive line was winning the battles up front early in the game. But I thought 
that sort of settled him into the rhythm and we started seeing Cole look a lot more like what we've been seeing. So, you know, I, I would say that late third quarter drive really helped turn that game on a dime. And, um, you know, and now as we look ahead to the Ohio game, you know, what do you think the keys are? What are some of your biggest keys uh, beating the Bobcats as matching starts? You know, now they're going to a stadium they don't play well in generally. Correct. Right. To find a way to do this weekend. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, again, it, 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 while it's while it can be irrelevant because none of the players or very few of the players on this team have had anything to do with it. Matter of fact, the Bulls have not played in Ohio since 2018 because the 2020 game during the COVID year was postponed literally as the Bulls were on the bus to Ohio, uh, positive tests with the Bobcats then postponed that game. So the very few of these guys on this team have ever played there before, but all that said, the bulls have struggled to win in Ohio. I think 2009 might be the last time they've won there. So, so you've got that kind of hanging over things a little bit. And frankly, you've got an Ohio team that's better than I think people thought number two scoring offense in the Mac right now. Um, number two in yardage. And I believe number one in passing. Yes, they are. And in Curtis Rourke, uh, you've got the number one passer in the max. So obviously stopping that is going to be the key. Ohio has been a bit one dimensional this year. They haven't run the ball great and their defense has not been good at all for everything that I just said to you about how good their offense has been. Um, their defense is uh, a 10th in the Mac in allowing points and dead last in allowing yardage and among the worst teams in the country in allowing yardage dead last in passing. So, so, you, you know, is this going to be a shootout? Quite possibly. Uh, I'll take my chances with the bulls on a shootout, but the way they're playing defense right now, uh, they're among the national leaders in takeaways. And clearly you saw the takeaways have a huge role in the win over Toledo. So can you force Curtis Rourke into making some mistakes in this game that can turn this game around um, because if you can take them off their offensive game, I don't know that they've shown that they can stop a lot of people. So um, it, it's going to be an intriguing game. Again, Ohio knows what's at stake here. They win this game. They're in first place and they'll hold the tiebreaker. And if they win out, they're going to go to, they're going to go to Detroit and Buffalo, regardless of how many other games they win the rest of the year will not. So that's a lot of motivation for the Bobcats. It should also be a lot of motivation for the Bulls as well and I think did now do you think maybe playing a quarterback this past week at Finn you know who obviously is highly regarded and we we obviously know the accolades he's put up do you think playing an offense like that can help prepare them for the challenge they're going to have playing in this Ohio offense <laughs> Yeah, I don't, there's no question. I mean, Rourke is not the runner that Finn is, and, and we were very worried, and and as we were shown, we, we should have been worried about Finn's running ability, but he's a pretty good passer, too, and they have they have four really good wide receivers, and Ohio's going to run three really good wide receivers at you again this week, too. The difference would be that, that Rourke is just not the physic, the athletic runner that Finn is. So does that make them somewhat more one-dimensional? Yeah, you'd like to think so. That would You'd think that would make it easier to defend, um, you know, because it's been the running and mobile quarterbacks that have given the Bulls some trouble this year. But, you know, again, uh, I, maybe I need to stop saying that because they handled one of the best mobile quarterbacks, not only in the MAC but maybe arguably in the country, and they never really let them hurt them too much. So um, so maybe it's not that big a problem anymore for the Bulls. We'll see. Um, but yeah, to me, that's the intriguing part of this matchup is, it, you know, and again, the way Buffalo's defense is playing right now, um, they've been fantastic. And and like I said, you know, you can be one of two kinds of defenses. You can ha put the hammer down on people, shut them down, don't allow them any yards. But that's a little unrealistic in football these days. Or you can be a team that allows some yards, but takes the ball away. Uh, and like I said, Buffalo comes in as one of the, the leading teams in the country. I think 17 takeaways now. And you've you've got a, a guy in Marcus Fuqua who's a ball magnet right now in the secondary. And and you know, and they and they've had, you know, how about this, John? Uh Isaiah King's play, uh, and then James Patterson had a similar play in the bowling green game. They've had two 
forced fumbles this year where they literally ripped the ball right out of the offensive player's hands and the ball never hit the ground. That's I don't I've seen a lot of football in my years and I don't know that I've ever seen that happen more than once a season or on a very rare occasion. Um, but the Bulls now have figured out a way to do that twice. They're very aggressive in going for the football, very aggressive in trying to force those takeaways. They practice it a lot. It is drilled into their heads and hey, so far so good. Absolutely. Hard to argue when you get the results like that. Um, you know, and I think Brad said to you on the post game that uh, if they beat the uh, the Bobcats, it's the lead. It's not sewn up, but it's pretty comfy. I got to tell you, I think if they beat the Bobcats, I don't really see who else is going to challenge them then to win the Mackies. I think at that point, it's pretty much, I mean, I guess you could say Kent State, but remember Kent State struggled to beat Akron who has not been playing well this year at all. I mean, do you think there's anyone else that could really, if UB gets by this game of the win, do you really think anyone else is really going to come for the Mac East? Well, it's always the Mac, John, and and strange things always happen. So, you know, you, you, you start the, the, the my answer by saying that, but the sheer math would, would tell you that if Buffalo beats Ohio, they'll now have a two game lead over Ohio, uh, uh, arguably whether it's whether it's numbers or not but so they'll have the the tiebreaker over ohio bowling and bowling green which are the two teams that are a game behind them now so so even if bowling green should win to go to four and one um and the bulls uh, and the bulls go to five and oh in the mac they'll still have essentially a game and a half lead over bowling green uh you know same thing with ohio you get that tiebreaker that gives you the extra lead so i believe in the scenarios of where they would go from there with games against a struggling central michigan team and a struggling akron team i think the bulls would be in a position to clinch the division before the home finale against kent state which is two games behind you right now as it is as well so as long as you maintain a two-game edge over kent state going into that finale they can't they can't beat you and take the division away that week anyway so long-winded way of saying in a lot of ways beating ohio next tuesday likely clinches the division for the bulls but i always put the addendum on it that i've seen strange stuff happen in the mac before so uh you know you never don't book your tickets to detroit yet but i mean i mean if you're if you're gonna start conference play you can't do any better than four and all i mean uh, no, no. Heading down you the know. home stretch i don't I don't really think that you could they could do much more to feel as good as you're feeling probably about them right now. I mean, the way they're playing and who they've beaten. Yeah, I mean, convincing wins over Eastern Michigan, uh, you know, holding Bowling Green uh, to seven points in in that game, uh, you know, doing what you did to Toledo, uh, a really good Toledo team that couldn't hold a, a lead like that. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, you can't ask for it to be any more convincing than it has. The, the, you know, the late game win over Miami, a tough, hard fought win over a really good team. So, yeah, I mean, just even in the ways that the Bulls have won those games, each somewhat differently than the others, um, you know, goes towards the character of you're going to get pushed. It's football. It's college football. And, and in this conference, you're always going to get pushed. You're never gonna, you're not going to win every game by four touchdowns. It just doesn't exist that way in college football. Um, you know, the, the fact that the Bulls won at least one of them by a big amount is great, but they got pushed in the others and they were able to hold their ground and push back and that that's a sign of a really good team right it's a real sign of a really good team at, at any level of football and uh you know i'm gonna i'm gonna make a little bit of a bold prediction here um i'll say this that you know one area that i do agree with brad on is that you know when you look at the remaining schedule for ohio after this game and you compare it to ub's i do still think ohio has a tougher road I actually think regardless, even though this is a huge game, I still think UB, I'm going to say the UB is going to win the East regardless because I could see Ohio stubbing their toe against one of their remaining opponents. I mean, UB's got Akron. I, I think UB still has the easier, um, easier schedule remaining, and I think that's still going to be a, a huge advantage for them um, over Ohio as we come down the home stretch here. Yeah, and I don't, I don't argue with you on any of your points, but you don't want to leave it in somebody else's hands, you know. True. And maybe an Ohio win over Buffalo is just 
the kind of boost to their mindset that helps them run the table the rest of the way. Uh, you know, so it, it, again, you know, what, what the Bulls have is the ability to control their own destiny. Uh, and that's what you ultimately want. And, and again, this has been a place where they have not played well. Uh, it, it's not the same Ohio team that, that the Bulls have faced even the last time they were there. I mean, it, it's it's got a lot of the Frank Solich influence, but I think even the Ohio people would admit it's taken a bit of a step back from the really high level, always competitive, always, you know, quality at every position Ohio team that was there for the bulk of the 2010s. Um, you know, they're, they're much more like everybody else in the MAC. They've got a lot of good players, maybe not as many as they'd like. Uh, and a lot of it depends on the matchup and how well guys play each week. And, you know, and, and that's kind of generally what the Mac has been on a, uh, you know, on a team by team basis. I think what Buffalo is doing a little bit this year is, is, is blowing that out a little bit in that they're not, they haven't been susceptible to the whims of the Mac. They've been above that. And, and honestly, there are, aren't a whole lot of teams that have ever been able to do that. It's just the, not the nature of the conference. So, you know, you got to go back to the Western Michigan team that ran the table uh, in 2016 to be really the last dominant Mac team. Every, everybody else, every other year is always somebody six and two or five and three and, and everybody else is, is four and four, three and five, you know, um, you know, so can the bulls be in a position where they could be a seven and one Mac team or an eight, no Mac team. I, you know, who knows right now they're, they got a chance to do it. The numbers to tell us that. And uh final thing here, Paul, before we let you go, you know, we've been talking about like some special wins like Miami, Ohio, you know, this victory against Toledo could certainly be another stepping stone, you know, it's pretty crazy. They've played three home games so far this year, and all three of them have come down to the last possession, whether it was That's true. winning on the Hail Mary or with three seconds left, that big pick 10 in the game. I mean, so you've had three barn burners, and then that last minute win over Miami, Ohio. What's it been like to call all those guys? I mean, if you're only going to play five home games instead of six this year, you want to make them exciting. And to this point, the UB Bulls have given their fans their money's worth and then some. Yeah, I hadn't even realized that till you said it. Uh, you, you know, you're right just because it's – because it's been such a disparity of home versus road this year, which it was going to be because of the schedule. But you're right. I mean, that Holy Cross game, obviously an incredible ending, not not fun for Bulls fans. But, you know, how often do you see games end on a Hail Mary like that? Uh, you know, the Miami game, a, a great comeback and a score with 30 seconds to go. And, you know, and then the way this game goes, it, absolutely. You're right. I mean, the home games have been great. The fan turnout's been good. Uh, you know, I know pe I hope people are enjoying the experience and you couldn't ask for much more and then you'll get two more to end the season uh you know to finish it out uh and i think to some degree it's good that the bulls don't have any midweek games as much as they're kind of fun uh, they don't always draw well it's, it's hard to ask people to come out to a game on a tuesday or a wednesday night so in this case the bulls only two midweek games are both on the road at ohio and at central michigan and then they're back for the two saturdays to end the season so uh yeah you know i mean if they come back not having lost after this two game winning streak i would expect some pretty good sized crowds depending on the weather for those final two home games uh based on everything you said and um actually there was just one more thing you know obviously they were reviewing at the end of the game against toledo first the referees announced they were reviewing something for targeting right it looked like a toledo player got banged up after we didn't really get much clear. Obviously, you were on the call on the broadcast. Um, did we get any updates? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's you're, you're so caught up in the moment of the interception and clinching the win, and you know, and then it, it took a moment even for me to realize what had happened. Uh, and it was Daquan Finn, the quarterback, and I did see an update on him today that his status is up in the air for their game on Saturday. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of specifics, but but he, you know, he took a pretty good shot. And then when you looked at the replay. Uh, you're like, your heart sank a little bit. It, I don't believe it would have been called targeting because the contact was not with the helmet. Um, it looked like it was the forearm of the Buffalo defensive player got a little high around the neck area. Um, you know, to be honest with you, John, if that's not the last play of the game, that's probably roughing the passer. Um, at any other point, that's probably a roughing the passer call. Uh, you know, whether, whether, 
you know, which which of course they they can't call that once it goes to targeting for review. So the flag would had to have been thrown at the time of the play. Uh, you know, is an official going to be willing to throw that on a game deciding final play like that? Um, in most cases, no. So uh, yeah, I think you know it, it it was probably a lot closer to having. Toledo had another play than maybe a lot of us think, um, but I think the call was the right one. As I looked at it, I did not see the indicators for targeting um, that that would have allowed that to uh, have had another play. So, um, you know, again, it, it very razor thin on that situation. Yeah, because where I was standing from like the one ends on the scoreboard side, you know, the, the official even waited he didn't even say that they were reviewing anything. And then he comes out as I'm starting to head back towards the gate. All of a sudden he says that there was no, after review, there was no foul for targeting. So I didn't, a lot of the crowd didn't know they were even reviewing anything. And then we kind of saw some players kneeing after the game. Right. So we wanted to just make sure everything, uh, just yeah, it's because Finn was down for a long time. The quarterback Finn was down for a good three or four minutes, if not longer, after the game. And that was where the you know it started as a wild celebration. And then when I think the Buffalo players saw what had happened, it, it got muted and they huddled around waiting for the doctors to tend to Finn, um, who took a really hard shot there. You know, uh, I mean, he did. And uh, he stood in there and he tried to make a play and he took a big shot. But but I give the Buffalo players credit for understanding the situation and putting a hold on the celebration until they knew what the what the whole deal was there. So and that was that was why everything went down the way that it did at the end of the game. So probably not, it's certainly not the fun way to end a thrilling victory like that. That's not what you want to see. Hopefully Finn's going to be okay. Um, but it was still a huge victory for UB. And uh, now they look ahead to Ohio. Thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate the time. And, uh, hey, maybe we'll be talking again next week, talking about a win over Ohio. Go Bulls. All right. You got it. Thanks, John. Folks, when I make promises on this show, I deliver. I told you I was going to have a treat in store for you tonight, and here it is. As great as it was to hear from Paul Peck, the voice of the Bulls, you're going to hear from somebody else now, Norm Rodriguez, and I call him the coolest dude in the South Towns. He is the voice of Jamestown Sports, and if you listen to this podcast in the past, you know, I did the post games with the Batavia Muck Dogs and the PGCBL. Well, he does the voice of the Jamestown Tarp Skunks, but he's also huge on the UB Bulls and really all things Buffalo sports. I got to talk with Norm as well about what a huge win this was for the UB Bulls, and he gave me some thoughts as well on the big matchup coming up in store against Ohio. Norm Rodriguez, Norman Rodriguez, but I, I like calling him Norm. I don't know. Do you prefer Norm or Norman? Norm's cool. Um, I've been going with that for my career. Plus, I was told the shorter the name, the better. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, obviously he's coming on talking about this big UB Bulls win over Toledo. And, uh, I mean, first of all, I thought it was the best of the West and the beast of the East, and it was the East who prevailed. Uh, just a huge win. What do you think this is going to do for this team? I mean, you know, you get a huge opponent like that come in, you're down three scores in the fourth quarter, and you come back and win. What do you think it's going to mean for this team? I think this is going to be a huge morale boost for sure. You start the season 0-3, now you're on a five-game winning streak, and you got aided in the fourth quarter with 24 fourth-quarter points, and plus their starting quarterback, Cole Snyder, he had all sorts of accolades when he was playing in Southwestern. Went to Rutgers for a couple of years, but didn't really play much. May not have panned out, so decides to go to UB. And so far for his first year as a starter in a college team, I think he's doing very well. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think uh, I think when you see the way they bounce back, I mean, th I would think, Norm, this has to put them as one of the best teams, if not the best team in the MAC. I got to think it's got to be one of the best. Oh, it has to be. It wasn't too long ago where UB was actually in the uh, top 25 and 
in their past, they have had a lot of players go into the NFL. And the main example right now, Khalil Mack. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody remembers what Khalil did, you know. Before that, you had James Starks, Naaman Roosevelt, as you were talking to me about the other day, you know, Drew Willie. Everybody yep. remembers those days. That really got them on the map. And, uh, yeah, and Naaman somebody... Roosevelt's actually the most current one playing still. Last I knew, he was with uh, Saskatchewan in the CFL. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, everyone remembers Starks winning that Super Bowl with Green Bay. I mean, it, it really is fun to see where this program has come. Um, and, and I mean, uh, the thing I would say is, you know, the Toledo quarterback, Finn, you know, people were saying after the Ohio State game, what Big Ten team is he going to play for next year? UB was able to pick him off four times and yeah, held him to just one touchdown. I mean, that that's that's pretty impressive. I mean, it's hard to do much better than that on defense against a quarterback like that. Yeah, and I agree, especially with putting up decent numbers like he is. And even in spite of that, I'm sure he'll have some letters for transferring somewhere. But the next guy they're playing for, the uh, Bobcats, not the Buckeyes of Ohio people, the Bobcats, their quarterback's averaging 301 yards passing a game. So this will be a big test for him. Yeah, but I, I, I think in a way, the fact that they've played a high-powered offense in Toledo – and we're able to come back and win that game. I think that's got to help them on defense when it comes to playing Ohio because they just played a high powered offense and were able to do really well, shut them out in the fourth quarter, outscore them 24 to zip. Yeah. And from taking a look at the uh, stat lines, though, for the Bobcats, they're no joke either. Their record is identical to um, UB. They're both five and three. Yeah. Just uh, we're one game ahead, four and oh in the conference. They're three and one. Um, they lost, I want to say to Kent State. Yeah, that was their only loss in the Mac. But this this is absolutely huge. I think if they if they pull out this victory in Ohio, I think the Mac East belongs to the Bulls because I don't really see anyone else challenging them. I mean, I don't know if there's anyone you might be thinking of, but I mean they beat Bowling Green, they beat Toledo, they beat uh so I, I really don't see, if they beat Ohio, I don't see anyone else that could really challenge them for this anymore. Yeah, and the catch is what you were saying about the Bobcats only having one loss in the division. That was actually an overtime, though, 31-24 to 24 against uh, Kent State. Yes, yeah, no, and that's, UB will see them, Kent State, later in the year to close out the season. But the one thing about Kent State, though, they struggled to beat Akron 33-27, in their last matchup. So, I mean, the fact that they struggled to beat Akron, who's been not, they've not been playing good football this year. You know what? That that makes me wonder, could Kent State really be much of a threat? I mean, I think it can happen, but I think if they beat the Bobcats, I would say, you know what? UB deserves to be the Mac East champs. And I would have to agree. I've caught them on TV whenever I can, and their defense mainly, they've been looking pretty solid, and – What's even better is one more win. They're automatically eligible for a bowl game as well because you need six. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much of the game, this past game that you caught, but I think one of the massive turning points, I mean, there were so many. I mean, obviously that first half fumble return for a touchdown to make it 10-7 was huge. But I, I think really it was the one big fumble recovery after that 60-yard run. Um, Paul Peck was just telling me about that earlier, you know, and I, I saw it down the near side, King going after him and, and stopping that score. I think that late third quarter drive, though, really started getting UB in a rhythm. We started seeing Snyder look the way he's looked the past four weeks. You know, in the first half, I think Toledo was doing a good job winning it up front with the defensive line. But uh, I don't know. Is there anything that stuck out to you as far as turning points? Well, I wasn't able to catch much of the game but from what you and I talked about when it was going on there were some big stops a couple of huge turnovers and UB was able to pull out a win sometimes no matter whether it's an ugly duckling or a beautiful swan a win's a win yeah I mean that's I mean uh, that was said perfectly my friend only Norm could say it like that um <laughs> another so, Normism <laughs> totally true totally true um I mean you know my, my feel about Ohio is that they have a really good offense, but their defense is porous. I mean, they've really struggled 
to stop a lot of teams on defense. Um, and I, I, quite frankly, if you look at the last few games for UB or Ohio, regardless, I actually, my bold prediction here is regardless of the outcome, UB is going to win the East. That's my feeling. Even though Ohio, if they win, would own the head-to-head tiebreaker, I could see Ohio stumbling over a couple teams they have left. I think UB has got a much easier schedule after Ohio. I would have to agree because the next game after they play Ohio, they're taking on Central Michigan, and they're only 2-6 and on the season. But the number one thing that UB needs to do is they can't relax. They need to keep that foot on the gas pedal. Absolutely. That, that, that's for sure. I mean, uh, Hey, and you know, if you're going to start on three, you can't bounce back any better than the way the UB bulls have winning five in a row, four and oh in conference play. It's really hard going into this game to feel any better about this team than you have to do right now. I mean, I, they've done pretty much everything they can do to make you feel confident about them down the stretch. Oh yeah. And from taking a look at the defensive side for um, the Ohio Bobcats, from what I see, they are in the bottom of the barrel in the Mac. Yeah, they they are. I mean, Paul, I was telling you earlier, they're one of the bottom teams in the country, too, when it comes to uh, they've gotten gashed through the air, and they inconsistent with the run defense. Um, I think, I think, you know, and obviously, Norm, mean, you cover a ton of football with WNY Athletics. Right, so, so you know the game extremely well. Um, how much as far as the, uh, like, the momentum from one game? You know, in baseball, they say momentum is the next day's starting pitcher. But with football, you know, the offense, the way it finished that fourth quarter against Toledo, um, your opinion on how much that momentum can carry over into the next game? Oh, well, you're, of course you're going to be – hyped up after being able to come back from a deficit like that and it's like that old cliche when it comes to sports but this is also in life as well it's not how you start it's how you finish that counts yeah no that's for you be i mean they're as you mentioned one win away from being bowl eligible and uh at five and three four and oh in the mac i mean life's pretty sweet as a bulls fan right now i mean hard to uh Hard to find too many knocks against them, but this uh, this is a stadium that they have not played well in recently. And in the last eleven matchups, ten wins have been by the home team. So uh, now we're going to kind of make you um, coach Rodriguez right here. If uh, if you're the coach of the Bulls, you know the history. Have not won at Peden Stadium in Athens since 2009. Um, what are you telling your guys going into that big matchup, knowing that? Recent history has not favored the road team, and uh, especially not for the Bulls against Ohio. It's a new dawn. It's a new season. Stick with the game plan. Stick with the guns. And <sighs> should it all work out, there's no reason they can't win this game. Yeah, no. So for UB, I mean, that's just uh, – I mean, it's going to be a test. But I think myself – that they can pull this one out. And um, I'm, I'm sure you're probably feeling pretty confident as well. I mean, how much fun, the parts that you have seen of them, I know you couldn't catch a whole lot of last year, but the parts you've seen, how much fun is this team to watch uh, with how well they're playing right now? Oh, it's been awesome. Like one of the main games I caught was, even though it came down to a Hail Mary that they were victimized with, the game against um, Holy Cross that I caught, Snyder looked so good. Like not only was he, able to sell out the play actions well with the Holy Cross defense. He was going downfield, and he had a really high completion percentage for most of the game until the uh, fourth quarter. And, you know, I think you're going to love the quote that uh, that Coach Mo told Paul after the game. You know, he was asking him, you know, all these people that are doubters, naysayers, that didn't believe in you when he started 0-3, like, what would you say to all of them now? And Coach Mo looked at him and goes, do you believe now? And I, I think just that four letter, four word response really just reflects the confidence that has to be going through that locker room right now. And it makes me think of another saying, though, John, even though this is a pro football one, this is one of the ones former Bills coach Marv Levy used to say when he was mainly doing the four Super Bowl run. When it's too tough for them, it's just right for us. 
Nice, nice. Let's see. That's 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 what I wanted right there. More gold, more gold. Another great norm is. I mean, I get it was Marv, but um, that's that's a good one to uh, to dig up there. Yeah, and I took a gander right now at the um, rankings defensively in the MAC with a couple of the teams UB's playing next. Out of the 12 teams, Ohio's eighth in total defense, and they could have a good shot also against Kent State because they're second to last. The team in last are uh, the Akron Zips. And actually, they'll play Akron the week before they play Ohio. I mean, so it, I guess it just kind of really brings me around to the point that if UB wins this game against Ohio, I just I don't see anyone challenging them then because Central Michigan's the West. Akron, like we just said, the abysmal numbers they have, uh, I don't see anyone coming. I, and I, I think at that point, uh, Bulls fans, you could start uh, making travel reservations for Detroit. Yeah, and also from taking a look on the offensive sides, though, too, and hats off to UB because their win against Toledo. Toledo is the second-ranked defense in the MAC, or offense, excuse me, second-ranked offense in the MAC division, so – Teams that can run up those points like a cash register and you're able to post a victory, that's major kudos. It, it absolutely is, especially the way they did it. I think the fact that they came back from three scores down to win, especially in football, I mean, that, that just has to speak to the resiliency. I mean, what a job by the UB balls. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. And also taking a look right here also because I'm kind of – brushing up a little bit this isn't terrible for them offensively they are in the middle of the road six out of the 12 teams offensively so not terrible by any means and they're just one spot below that on defense so even though it's not elite status they're getting it done when it matters the most and that's what matters in the end just a couple more things here norm before uh before we let you go um number one i, I think one thing that ub has wanted to clean up has been hanging on to the football, not turning it over. Toledo had six turnovers in the game, including three interceptions in the second half. UB only had one the entire game. Um, you know, obviously covering all the playoff games you have for WNY and, and all the high school games, everything, and college. I mean, when you hang on to the football and you can clean up like that, when you win the turnover margin six to one, I mean, I, I got to think that's pretty massively important uh, to uh, to winning a game on the gridiron. Oh, yeah, the plus to minus ratio is absolutely vital when it comes to playing the game of football because that old saying, defense wins championships, that's rung true time and time again, and that history will repeat itself sooner, if not later. And another thing they did a good job of cleaning up is the uh, discipline, the penalty flags. They only had five penalties in the game. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, even in some of their wins, they were getting double-digit penalties. Um, you know, when, when a team can make these types of adjustments in season, you know, how much how much do you give credit to Coach Lindquist for um, getting his guys to clean up their act, and how much of it is on the team as far as, um, you know, being able to make these types of adjustments? Obviously, we know football – is probably one of the most physical sports out there, if not the most. And for them to be able to make these types of changes and adjustment in season, how much credit do you attribute to the coaching staff and how much would you um, put to towards the players? Honestly, it would have to be 50-50 because the coach is coming up with the schematics and the players are executing it very well. So getting the, all the credit to one person, that just, I think, would be – very egotistical, I would say. And um, that's just my opinion. <laughs> no, I, I I hear that. Um, and I would say, uh, unfortunately, as as great of a win as it was for UB, didn't necessarily end the way we wanted it to, in the sense that Finn got injured, the quarterback for Toledo, after the game. His status next Saturday is up in the air, and uh, there was actually a lot of confusion at the end of the game. You know, I mean, I was actually at the game in the stadium and, uh, you know, the officials were actually reviewing for targeting, but the official never actually made that announcement. And then finally he comes out and says, after review, 
there was no foul for targeting. I mean, um, and then you see that Finn was down for quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I'm sure in the games that you've covered, you've seen something like that. Obviously, when it's a great game like that, you never want to see something like that. Oh, not at all. Yeah, I mean, hopefully hopefully our best to uh, to Finn. Hope that he's okay. Hope that he's going to be um, able to recover and get back on the field soon. But um, So it was kind of a little bit of a bumming way to end the game. But ultimately, UB was able to uh, – to pull off the victory and that's um that's huge uh one last thing here norm you know what we we've talked about ub but we are a one buffalo um community so uh i want to get your thoughts um uh as far as how about those buffalo bills standing there five and one going into kansas city but alan was able to exercise those demons from the divisional <laughs> playoff round and from taking a look at the comparison of how both quarterbacks look taking a loss Allen was just stone-faced when he was sitting there in overtime after that touchdown was scored by KC but when Allen got his revenge Mahomes had a look like he was just gonna cry his eyes were beginning to water up he gave up Bronx cheer and I don't mean to sound sadistic but I thought that was kind of funny yeah that that certainly was interesting I mean it certainly looked like he was tear up. I, I mean, listen, the, the Bills did a great job going in there, doing what they had to do. And um, if all lines up well, if there's a rematch between the two, it's going to be in Buffalo, not uh, not KC. So that I think it'll be a lot of fun, especially for people like us that were around but really young to remember a whole lot as far as those early 90s Bills teams. And, um, you know, this is sort of our chance to to have that. How cool would it be to host the AFC Championship game at Orchard Park? That would be awesome. It would be the first time they've done that since uh, 1994, and that was coincidentally against the Chiefs. The starting quarterback was Joe Montana. Bruce Smith knocked him out of the game. He had a concussion. Then longtime Seahawk Dave Craig came in, cut it to seven, but then Buffalo ran away with it. So it would be pretty cool to get some playoff revenge in Buffalo, but next week, though, the thing we got to focus on, they're taking on the Green Bay Packers back at Highmark, and for the first time in Aaron Rodgers' career as a starter, he's facing a double-digit point deficit as an underdog. Buffalo are 10.5-point favorites to win that game. Yeah, no, it's it's certainly going to be a lot of fun, I think, especially on a Sunday night. Um, you're a huge Miami Heat guy, huge Cleveland Cavaliers fan. Um, but uh, if they met in the Eastern Conference Finals, Cavaliers or Heat, which one are you going with, Norm? Oh, Heat. And the main reason why, Miami has a lot more experienced postseason players than the Cavs do. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I, wanna, I, wanted to, I wanted to test your allegiance a little bit, but uh, you, uh, you, uh, you didn't really have much hesitation coming up with an answer for that. Uh, one last thing, just uh, once again, only because you kind of broke up a little bit, just remind listeners and viewers where they can hear your uh, hear your podcast, because I've listened to some episodes, very well done, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners and viewers would like to hear, would like to hear it as well. All right, well, it's Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. on 107.9 FM WRFA, and if it can't be tuned in live, that's no issue. All the segments new and old will be on SoundCloud on WRFA's account for it, as well as their mobile app as well. Both are free. So for any of the listeners to this podcast here, don't hesitate to download it and listen in on me. It's a sports talk show on radio. It's called Storm and Norman's Primetime Sports Show. And on that note, Norm, thank you so much for coming on and uh, being the kind of my co-host today. And we look forward to, to having you on again next week. Who knows? Maybe we'll be talking about another uh, big UB Bulls victory. All right. Have a good night. Thank you, Norm. And Norm, as promised, always very entertaining, certainly knows his stuff. And we thank him for coming on and joining this edition of Bullseye Nation. And we hope you enjoyed the interview with Paul Peck as well as we continue to cover this huge win for your UB Balls. 
Now, before we sign off, we want to give you some scores around the MAC and then preview the Ohio Bobcats matchup ourselves. But we are going to start with the scoreboard around the MAC and we'll take a look beginning in the MAC East. Kent State hanging on for a 33 27 win over Akron. That's a little bit of an eye opener because Akron has not been playing well all season and Kent State really struggled with them. Remember, UB hosts Kent State. To end the season, and the week before that, they host Akron. Bowling Green went into Central Michigan, took care of them 34 18. It was Eastern Michigan eking out a close win at Ball State 20 16. Ohio beat Northern Illinois 24 17. Of course, Ohio 3 1 in the MAC, and they are UB's next opponent. Really, one of the last biggest tests of the season for your balls. And Western Michigan. Beating Miami, Ohio, 16 to 10. Boy, are they really struggling. They really started off pretty well considering their starting quarterback got hurt, but they have hit the skids recently and now find themselves in a very deep hole in the MAC East by UB getting the huge head to head win earlier in this season. So that is a look around the MAC scoreboard. And now we will look ahead ourselves to the Ohio Bobcats. So for UB, this is a series that has been dominated by the home teams. 10 of the last 11 games have gone in favor of the host. So UB is going to need to try and buck that trend. And to do it, they're going to really need to have another strong defensive showing. The thing for Ohio is that even though their defense is rounding into shape, it's middle of the pack average at best. It's not like Toledo's where it was a little bit better higher up. I think the thing for UB to remember in this game is not only to stay disciplined like they did today, but keep the quarterback under control and keep the Ohio offense under control. That's one thing about the Bobcats. Whether they've won or they've lost, they've always put up points. This is an explosive offense, much like Toledo, and I think they have more weapons than the Rockets do. Now, maybe the quarterback, Rourke, isn't quite as great offensively as Toledo's quarterback, Finn, is, but he's up there. And so it's going to be another big day for your UB defense. But I think if the Bulls can go in there and just contain them, much like they did to Finn today, I know they've struggled at Peden Stadium in the past, but as UB has shown, this is a new year, a new team. And if they could find a way to pull this one off against Ohio, they'll be sitting pretty. Like I said, I think UB is going to win the MAC East either way, given the remaining schedules. But if they beat Ohio, there's really no doubt to the claim that then they are the best team in the MAC, hands down. So that will be the next game coming up. And that's when we're going to speak with you next. That is going to wrap up this edition of Bullseye Nation, the UB Bulls post game podcast. I am John Gruba. Thank you so much for tuning in. And for UB, one more time, the final score in a battle of East meets West. It was the East prevailing, your UB Bulls, trailing by three scores, 27 to 10, entering the fourth. Well, your Bulls overcame that and won 34-27 over the Toledo Rockets. Until next time, I am John Kruba. Thank you for tuning in. And this has been the Bullseye Nation postgame show. As always... Go UB Bulls go. What a huge win. 34-27 over Toledo. Thanks for tuning in. Good night, everybody, and go UB Bulls.